Well, Eric King coming to you once again from Nugget of Truth. We're going to be looking at our third parable in Matthew chapter 13. This is Kingdom Discourse number 11. Kingdom Discourse number 11. Now, we've already covered two parables. Uh, the, the one having to do with um, the sower, uh, sowing, sowing the, the, uh, the seed among the different soils, and the soils representing the different conditions of man's heart. And then we had an interlude of where Jesus talks about and quotes Isaiah, talks about the fact that not all will see or understand these parables as significant and important as they are. And then in verse 24, we covered the second parable, the weeds among the wheat or the wheat and the tares parable. Now we're in our third parable, starting in verse 31. Now this parable is only two verses long, brothers and sisters, only two verses long. But this parable, small as it is, just like, the parable itself, talking about a small mustard seed, proverbial statement of the time. Of course, we know that mustard seed isn't the smallest seed, but it, proverbially it was used uh, to express something significantly small in the time of Christ. And Christ, using the language of the time, the proverbs of the time, talk, gives a message using the parable of the mustard seed. Now, the mustard seed was figuratively used to, to represent something tiny and minute. The Jewish Pharisees would talk about a blood drop the size of a mustard seed. Or when they were debating over Torah or ceremonial law, they would talk about some aspects of the law that are being broken, but those aspects are uh, significantly the size of a mustard seed. So they get into intricate interpretations of, of the law of Moses, and they would use the mustard seed to represent the little portions of the law that they were constantly trying to understand and tweak. Ultimately, they created laws upon laws upon laws, and the legal dispensation became more and more stringent and more difficult to follow. And we have the writing of the Talmud, which is the commentary on the Torah, and you have additional laws, and it gets really ridiculous. And they were weighted down by the Old Covenant, brothers and sisters. And we're going to find that in this parable, it is an introduction not only to the church age, but it's, it's an introduction to the new covenant. Now, when you ask a Christian today, you're under the new covenant, what is the new covenant? Hmm, what is the new covenant? Well, it's not the old covenant. Christians say, and what is the old covenant? Well, when we refer to the old covenant, specifically, we're referring to the Mosaic dispensation or the legal dispensation, the dispensation of law, which was given 430 years after Abraham uh, was called out to create that nation through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then when we get to the time of Moses on Mount Sinai, we have the beginning of that covenant given. And the covenant was sealed with blood. It says in the book of Hebrews that all covenants were sealed with blood. It says that even after Moses got the law and presented the law to him, that he had sprinkled the tabernacle with blood, sealing that covenant. We also know that Jesus Christ ushers in the new covenant. So when we talk about the church dispensation or the church age, we're also talking about the overlapping of covenants and understanding covenants. And this is why it's important for you to stay tuned here at Nugget of Truth and study all the kingdom discourses. Like I said, this is discourse number 11. So that as you go through, there's building blocks in there. You have to understand the four eternal covenants. The first eternal covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. The second eternal co covenant, the Palestinian covenant, which had to do with the territory and land. It's an elaboration of the geographical blessings of literal Israel that was given in the Abrahamic covenant. And then the third eternal covenant you have uh, is uh, the, uh, the, the new covenant. So you have the Abrahamic covenant, Palestinian covenant, the, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. I skipped the Davidic covenant. What I meant to say is the Davidic covenant, and then finally the new covenant. So what we have to understand before I read this parable is the fact that these four eternal covenants, the first three, the Abrahamic, the Palestinian, and the Davidic, those covenants now are already producing fruit, partially being fulfilled. The Abrahamic covenant would bring blessings to all humanity, would ab ab absolutely and unconditionally present and be the, the means through which the seed, Yeshua HaMashiach, would be born. We know that those portions of the Abrahamic covenant have come true. The geographical blessings and ethnic blessings of Israel and the Jewish people 
um, are starting to come true. Uh, in 1948, Israel again becoming a nation, the Israelites returning to their land. So we see portions of the Palestinian covenant mentioned in Deuteronomy 30 having to do geograph with geographical blessings. We already have things being put in place that are beginning to help establish more thoroughly that Davidic covenant, which will ultimately be established during the millennial reign of Christ, which is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant in fullness. Now, the Davidic covenant, we're already in, we are already, as the church, we're already uh, partially in the fulfillment of, of the Davidic covenant. We have our king, Yeshua HaMashiach, who will ultimately sit on that Davidic throne. So we have that portion of it fulfilled. And ultimately, this new covenant um, involves the Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, and the Davidic covenant. The new covenant involves all of those coming to their fruition through the final and complete revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah. They all culminate in Jesus Christ, and finally that new covenant uh, uh, will come to a full and complete understanding. As, as all of these covenants, we can look at the four eternal covenants as flowers blossoming, and they're, and they're starting to open, and they're starting to blossom, and eventually they'll be in full bloom. So we are in the new covenant, we are in the new covenant, but we are not in the fullness of the new covenant. Now I know that sounds complicated, to some of you, but as I said before, I'll say again, study all of the scriptures with us here at Nugget of Truth so that you can begin to understand what it is that we're talking about here. Now before I read this parable, this third parable that we're going to be looking at, the parable of the mustard seed, I want to establish a little bit more about the new covenant, what the new covenant is for us. Now we know that a covenant has to be sealed with blood for it to be, for it to be in working order. And we know that Christ uh, sealed that covenant, the new covenant, with his blood. We read in, in the New Testament, in the epistle of Hebrews chapter 9, this is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. That's uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 18, which I mentioned earlier. The first covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the old covenant, um, that when we refer to the old covenant, we're referring to the Mosaic covenant, the legal dispensation. It says that, that when Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll, and all the people, he said, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, it says in verse 22 of Hebrews 9, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There's no forgiveness of sins. So we find that this covenant was sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that the law, the, the Mosaic law, was only a shadow of good things to come. And the new covenant replaces it. We read in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 7, For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, the Mosaic covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. So, we understand that because a will is in force only when somebody has died, it will never... It never takes effect while the one who made it is still living. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 17. So since Jesus died and his blood was spilled, his perfect blood, stamping the beginning of the new covenant, we can say that we officially entered the new covenant at the death of Jesus Christ on the cross when he said it is finished and he breathed his last breath, sealing the covenant. Now we know that Jesus says when he partakes of the Lord's Supper, he says this is the blood of the new covenant shed for you. So every time that we partake of the Lord's Supper, brothers and sisters, we are proclaiming, we are making a proclamation that we have entered that covenant. By partaking of the Lord's Supper, we now are signing the contract, so to speak, that we have entered that covenant, uh, the new covenant that Christ started. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. I want you to remember that verse, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. Notice that it hasn't completely disappeared. 
So this is how we understand this parable. The new covenant is blossoming. Now we have some of the blessings of that new covenant. The, there are several blessings in the final new covenant that we are a part of because of Jesus Christ. And the main part is that we are seen sinless now through the perfect life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by accepting Him as our Messiah, by accepting Him as our Savior, by letting His blood uh, atone for our sins and seal that new covenant, we enter that covenant without sin because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ who takes away our sins. Now He becomes the high priest of that new covenant and is, in, is officiating for us in that new covenant, bringing us reconciliation with God. So by calling this covenant new, He has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete is aging and will soon disappear. Now let's go and begin our study with the parable, having established the fact that we've entered this new covenant through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ by accepting Him as our Messiah, as our Savior, we enter this new covenant. Now, in Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 31, He told them another parable. This is the third parable we're looking at here in Discourse, our Kingdom Discourse study number 11. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. Here Jesus says that the mustard seed, though being small, proverbially it was used as representing the smallest part of anything that you were talking about when you use the mustard seed as a proverb. He says that the kingdom of God in this case is like the mustard seed, small and insignificant though it may seem. It, it, it grows into a large bush. Now the mustard seed that, that he's talking about back then in their land, in their, in their area in Jerusalem, the mustard seed would grow into something what we would call similar to deer brush today. It was a it was a eight to nine, sometimes ten foot shrub, brush, small tree, if you will, where the birds loved to congregate in. It was a place for the birds to hide when the winds came, the storms came, or when prey came to eat them, they would run into the mustard seed brush and they loved to eat the little seeds that the mustard seed contained. So it was a haven for them. And so the kingdom of God is like this mustard seed. Now we, court, we know that Jesus Christ ultimately was the seed that was planted, that, that the gospel message, He is the living Word. So, uh, a babe born in a harsh world, a teacher on a hillside, condemn, a condemned man, slain and shameful, condemned and, and dying on a cross, an empty grave, only eleven small men believing in Him, what a tiny seed in a vast and alien field the whole situation seemed, the early beginnings of the New Covenant, the Christian message. How insignificant. So we see that from small things come great things in the plan of God. Now we also notice that these birds that take nest that come into this tree. Now we notice that the mustard seed, it says in the parable, was planted in a field. So if we're going to be consistent in our parable explanations, in the previous parable, the parable of the weeds and the wheat, Jesus says that the field uh, represents the world. Verse 38, the field is the world and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom in our past study. So if we're going to be consistent, this mustard seed was planted in the field, it was planted in the world. Now he says the birds. Now if we're going to be consistent in our parable interpretation, what do birds mean in previous parable we studied? Well, in the previous parable, in the sower and the soils, the birds were not good, represented things that were not good. They didn't represent good people. They represented people, thieves and robbers, that were using the kingdom message, that were using the gospel message for their own, for their own purposes, for vain glory. So when it says that, the birds lodge themselves in this mustard tree as it grows, as the kingdom of God begins to grow. They're, they're, they're the fowls of the air. They're the agents of the wicked one, we could say. And the only reason why they come and flock in this message of the kingdom and amongst Christians is that um, they are there for, uh, to take shelter for advantage of worldly things. They're there to take it advantage of... Of, of things in status quo. They're, they're there only to see what they can get out of it, not what they can give and what they can make better, but they're there to get, see what they can gain 
uh, uh, from it. So we can say that this mustard tree began with about 120 believers on the day of Pentecost. This mustard seed began with about 120 believers, and since then it has it has blossomed. And even the birds of the air, common folk, unconverted folk, like to come and hang out there every now and then. And a lot of them, unfortunately, like to come and create ruckus, which we don't need. So we need to understand that that this parable of the kingdom of, of heaven, like a seed that starts out something very significant and grows, also represents the, the birth of the new covenant. The birth of the new covenant. We are in the new covenant, but we're not in the fullness of the new covenant. The new covenant is made specifically and literally with literal Israel. And the Gentiles become blessed by this new covenant because we now enter the new covenant during the ecclesiastical dispensation. And we know that as this kingdom message begins to grow by calling this covenant new he has made the first one obsolete and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear as the mustard seed comes into full fruition Hebrews chapter 8 verse 13 uh, by calling this covenant new he has made the first one obsolete and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear now this new covenant that we're in is going to take on a greater manifestation as all of the covenants um, merge and come together. The four eternal covenants merge and come together in the final blossoming of this new covenant. The Abrahamic covenant will come to fruition. The Palestinian covenant, all the blessings, geographical blessings and ethnic, ethnic blessings for Israel will come to full blossom at the at the height of the new covenant and and the davidic kingdom will be established on earth and the and the lion and the lamb will lay together in perfect harmony and jesus himself yeshua hamashiach will be sitting on that davidic throne and ruling that davidic throne under the complete and full fulfillment of the new covenant now the new covenant is an, is unconditional it's a covenant of grace and it's a covenant of resting in Christ. The new covenant is an everlasting covenant, and is uh, and, it, and it is unconditional. The new covenant also promises the impartation of a renewed mind and and heart, uh, which may be uh, uh, done and is being done through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, the rebirth of uh, being born again into that new covenant. And of course, that day of rebirth for Israel will come at the end of, in fullness, will come at the end of the seven-year tribulation when they will, as a nation, look upon him whom they've pierced, and many of them, their hearts will then be regenerated and, and, and conditioned to fully enter that restored Davidic covenant when we, will, when we will see and experience the fullness of the new covenant during that millennial reign of Christ on earth. So, uh, the new covenant involves forgiveness of sin, it, it, it involves God removing the iniqui all our iniquities. And as church members now, we, we should not take it for granted, the fact that, that, we, that we are partaking of that covenant of complete forgiveness of all of our sins. I mean, you can't enter this kingdom, this coming kingdom, this Davidic kingdom, uh, with sin. You can't in no one can enter that kingdom with sin. So the new covenant, the first phase of that new covenant is important because it has to do with our restitution with God and our restoration with God it has to do with the Holy Spirit indwelling us and living inside of us and it has to do with so many more things that we'll get into in, in, in further studies and I would urge you to look at our previous studies because we cover a lot more detail and these are building blocks as we proceed to begin to understand more fully the message of the kingdom of God and what it means to us today in this ecclesiastical dispensation as Christians. So I hope that you look at this parable of the mustard seed and look at, at the, how God has taken something quite insignificant and small and from it something great is occurring. We see it every day. We see it in, in, in the lives of fellow believers. We see it in the blessings and the prayers that are being answered uh, on earth because of the presence of the church on earth. The church is not always going to be here. The church is here but for a short time. We are ambassadors. We are calling people into this coming kingdom of God. And so stay tuned and mature in your faith here. Let us all grow together under and in this new covenant that we are in.